Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Jason Riley is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and a commentator for Fox News. Born in Buffalo, New York, Mr. Riley earned a bachelor's degree in English from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Mr. Riley is the author of several books, including Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, and his most recent volume, which we'll be discussing today, False Black Power. Jason, welcome. Thank you for having me. I want to get to the argument in False Black Power, but let's start with your conclusion. What is false black power and what is true black power? False black power is political power, political clout. Um, true black power is human capital, uh, something that can't be taken away from an individual or a group. Uh, by human capital, I'm referring to, uh, it's, a, it's a term that economists use, but it's essentially it refer, refers to culture, uh, cultural traits, habits, behaviors, attitudes um, that allow a group uh, to produce uh, economic value in what they're doing. Um, and that human capital, I argue, is much more important than having political capital when it comes to advancing a group socioeconomically. All right. The argument in false black power, your point of departure goes back more than half a century to the Moynihan Report of 1965, uh, written by then Assistant Secretary of Labor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, later became a longtime senator from New York. The formal title of the report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. Moynihan noted the rise among black families in inner cities mm -hmm of families headed by single women and wrote, the Negro family in urban ghettos is crumbling. Mm -hmm. Why did Moynihan believe that the families were crumbling? What was the cause he associated with that well, datum? The, uh, well, this, this had grown out of the black migration out of, out of the South, um, which was very hard on families, uh, frankly. Um, by the way, this, what's, uh, I, yeah. I just want to observe, brief book, readable, mm -hmm. and I picked it up thinking, here, we have a polemic, we have an argument. It's, <laughs> it, it is that, but it is, a, it is deeply concerned with history, mm -hmm. with African-American history. All right, so it, we have... It, it, and it is, because it's, it's concerned with um, an aspect of black history that I don't think gets a lot of attention. Um, people sort of think we went from uh, slavery to uh, Rosa Parks refusing to sit down on a bus, uh, or go to the back of a bus, and, and, and then the civil rights movement took us to where we are today. But I, I think we're missing a lot of material here, and that is the period in between the end of slavery and the beginning of the, the modern day civil rights movement and the advancement that was going on within the black community. Frankly, at a time when the federal government was, could care less what was going on. There, 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 ha there was no Civil Rights Act. There was no Voting Rights Act yet. This was during Jim Crow. This is post-reconstruction. And I think that, that this uh, period of black history is um, uh, underappreciated. Uh, what was going on at that time? How were blacks advancing or not advancing at that time period? And I think when, when we talk about what should be done today to help blacks, right. We should look at this period and study this period, what was going on, and, that, and so that's so what I, I try to Mo do. Moynihan yeah. misses it, doesn't he? Well, what Moynihan um, uh, found was actually uh, common knowledge among a lot of black scholars. There wasn't a lot of originality to what Moynihan was saying. The originality was that Moynihan was saying it, the government was saying it, but he relied on a lot of black sociologists at the time mm -hmm. who had reached a similar conclusion, people like E. Franklin Frazier, and there were, uh, th this was, this, this, this um, observation about what was going on breakdown in black of America, family. the breakdown right. of America, was something that others had been observing. What was new was that it was in a government report put out by, uh, by the Labor right. Department. Right, all right. And the, the next step in your argument mm -hmm. is a book, a 1976 book, mm -hmm. by the way, this makes your argument that I had not even heard of this mm -hmm. book. 1976 book, The Black Family in Slavery and Freedom by Herbert Gutman, a professor at the City College of New York. And Gutman wrote, if enslavement caused the widespread development among African Americans of the fatherless matrifocal family, that is to say, the rise of families mm -hmm. headed by single women, mm -hmm. where the fathers were absent, and Moynihan in one way or another suggested this was a mm -hmm. result of slavery. If enslavement caused it, mm 
then such a condition should have been even more common among urban Afro-Americans closer to the right. time of slavery. Right. Yeah. And Gutman said, that's not what the evidence shows. What right. did the evidence right. show? So Gutman was critiquing um, the Moynihan report. Right. He didn't like the fact that Moynihan had attributed the breakdown of the, of the black family to slavery. He said, wait a minute. Um, I agree with you that we've had this breakdown, but can we attribute it to slavery? Right. Let's look at what was going on in the black family both during slavery and in the years immediately following slavery. And if you look at, say, census data, uh, going back to the late 1800s all the way through the 1940s, um, uh, rates of black marriages exceeded rates of white marriages during this entire period. In every census from 1890 to 1940, uh, black marriage rates are higher than white marriage rates. So if, <laughs> if slavery is the cause of, of br black family breakdown that we see in the 60s and 70s and mm -hmm. 80s, um, wait a minute, did it skip a few generations? This legacy of slavery right. skip a few generations and then reassert itself? Or is something else responsible for this breakdown? And Gutman was, was, a, was very liberal. I mean, I, I, I think he self-identified as a Marxist, actually. Um, so he didn't have a, a political he agenda here. He was an honest he Marxist. Was an on, he was an honest intellectual. Right. And he said, let's look at the evidence here and not make assumptions. And what's, what's incredible is that today, we continue to make these assumptions right. about how to explain the social breakdown we see in the black community today. We automatically ascribe it to the legacy of slavery or the legacy of Jim Crow, when in fact there are many, many other factors that uh, we should be considering. False black power, mm -hmm. I'm quoting you. During slavery, its immediate aftermath, and on through the first quarter of the 20th century, so we've got about almost eight decades there that you're covering here, mm -hmm. The vast majority of black children were raised in two-parent mm -hmm. households. Black marriages were as long-lasting and stable as the marriages of economically comparable whites, and the black female-headed homes that did exist tended to be, like their white counterparts, comprised of older widows, not teenagers, raising children alone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the history and this is one of your principal points here, the history has been so forcibly submerged. Mm -hmm. I read that and thought, is Jason right? Can that possibly be so? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not the narrative that you see coming out of um, uh, the left or the traditional civil rights groups, who of course have their, their, their own agenda and, and it, that's the reason they push the narrative that they do. But no, the facts, the facts are the facts, uh, Peter. And do you find and, that when you yeah, speak at yeah. colleges and universities, I know you do a lot of that, of course you're on Fox News and other shows, do people write to you and say that can't be so? Do you, do you they, encounter there, the there, same There is blank? a fair amount of disbelief, yeah, um, that, that how can this be true? This doesn't seem right. It's somewhat counterintuitive. Um, but yes, I do, I do get that. And, and again, it's because we have accepted this narrative that what we see today in black in America uh, is a result of the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. And what I argue in the book is that um, what we see today is the legacy of the great society, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> of the legacy of 60s programs that were well-intentioned, um, trying to help uh, low-income blacks in particular, but had uh, unintended consequences. And, and today we see um, uh, the consequences uh, that uh, those policies um, uh, engendered. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm getting at there. Barack Obama, false black power. Obama's election was the culmination of a civil rights strategy that prioritized political power to advance blacks. And eight years later, we once again learned the limitations of that strategy. Let's take both of those assertions. Mm -hmm. The culmination of a civil rights strategy. Right. Explain that. Well, <clears throat> um, prior to the 1960s, I think that uh, the black leadership in this country had been focused on developing that human capital that I talked about earlier. Booker uh, T. Washington is Booker it fair T. To Washington, him? Uh, Frederick Douglass, all, all through the 20s, 30s, and 40s, blacks were focused on becoming more literate, uh, uh, educating themselves. Um, uh, Frederick Douglass gave a famous speech in which he said, essentially, stop helping us, didn't he? Well, <laughs> I mean, that's so. The government government wasn't going to come save blacks, and they understood that. And Got so it. they set about the hard work of improving themselves. 
and tremendous progress was being made. If you look at uh, what was going on in black America uh, prior to the 1960s in terms of uh, black education advancement, blacks entering the skilled professions, black home ownership rates, uh, black white income gaps were shrinking. Even in the criminal justice system, Peter, in the 1940s, uh, the black homicide rate fell by something like 18%. In the 1950s, it fell by another 20%. So here you had uh, these black-white gaps in the criminal justice system after, that we see today. That's after the migration to, to the northern cities. Yeah. So those right, and, and that's an interesting point because <clears throat> you would have expected to find the opposite because urban yes. communities tend to be more violent than rural communities. Yes. So you have this huge influx of people from urban communities to urban from, from uh, rural, rural from the south to, to urban right. communities, and yet you see a decline in violent crime among this group. Uh, incredible, incredible. Um, but again, but my point was that the advancements that blacks were making prior to the modern day civil rights movement is something we seldom study or discuss or take into account in any length. And I think this is a period of time that deserves a lot more study. What were blacks doing to, to narrow gaps that were narrowing at this time and have since either stalled, slowed, or in some senses reversed course and started to widen and again. And my point is that mm -hmm. blacks <clears throat> were focused on developing that human capital. And they were doing and so. They, and they were doing that. Then we get the 1960s. Right. And the shift, com, com, uh, there, there's a shift to acquiring political capital, integrating political institutions. The Voting Rights Act comes along and it was a tremendous success. Um, you had uh, voter registration rates in 1964 in, in the South, places like Georgia, Alabama, uh, single digits, black voter registration rates. A year after the Civil Rights Act, they're up to the 50%, 60%. I mean, it was a it tremendous worked. success. Right. It worked. And then the leadership, the black leadership in particular, turned to focus on electing more black officials. And the thinking was, if we could elect more black officials, the rest will take care of itself. Black socioeconomic advancement will flow naturally from black political clout. We just need to get more of our kind into office and the rest will take care of itself. We need and our share of political, political power. Capital. And this strategy too has been a success on its own terms. In other words, black political office holders have proliferated yes. in this country. Uh, between uh, 1970 and 2010, they went from fewer than 1,500 to more than 10,000, including black mayors, uh, black governors, black congressmen, black school superintendents, black police chiefs and fire chiefs, blacks, and, and in large cities with large black populations, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta. So blacks gained a tremendous amount of political clout with this strategy. The problem is that the rest didn't happen the way it was supposed to. In other words, if you look at what happened in Marion uh, Barry's Washington, D.C., or Sharp James's Newark, or Coleman Young's Detroit, the black poor became more impoverished on their watch. Under and black leadership. Under black leadership, which is not to say that there's a causal link here, that because there were black mayors, we didn't see black advancement, because this black advancement didn't occur under white mayors and white right. governors right. and white congressmen too. So I'm not making- But, but at a it, minimum, the hope was frustrated. The hope, the hope. And, 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 and I think that um, the idea that black political clout would lead to more black economic advancement was misplaced. And, right. and, and the reason we should have known this, and this gets into the work of, of, of uh, Thomas Sowell, someone you've interviewed many times, who has made this point repeatedly in his scholarship, which is that if you look at other groups, um, political advancement is not the route that they took to economic advancement. Typically, the reverse happened. A group advanced economically first, right. and then got involved in politics later. Right. That's the root of everything from uh, Jewish Americans to Italians. Uh, 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 one exception to that rule is the right. Irish. Yes who were politically extremely successful. You had uh, political Irish political machines running cities like uh, Philadelphia and Boston 
but there was no Irish middle class to speak of. In fact, it wasn't until the decline of those political machines that we saw the rise of an Irish middle class. Uh, and, and so if you look at the history of other groups, not only in the US, but in other countries, there was no need, there was, there was no reason to expect that simply putting blacks in office was gonna lead to socioeconomic advancement for blacks. Jason, Barack Obama, mm -hmm. two, two, two data points here. One is obvious. A country, this is a country in which African Americans make up just 13% of the population. The country elected a black man mm -hmm. and then it re-elected him. Mm -hmm. False black power. Here's the second point. The Obama administration's racial politics almost certainly harmed mm -hmm. racial discourse. By 2016 polls showed race relations had reached their lowest point mm -hmm. in nearly a quarter of a century. Huge achievement, almost everyone would argue, I think, to elect a black man president of the United States, and eight years later, somehow, Jason contends, race relations are worse, not better. What happened? Well, President Obama is a politician, first and foremost, and he is a liberal politician who ascribes to identity politics. Um, like many others in his party do. Uh, in, fact, in fact, it's probably been uh, worse today than it was when, when he was in office, this adherence to identity politics. And that is appealing to uh, various uh, voting blocks, uh, telling them to vote for, for, for politicians who look like them, who share their racial or ethnic background, that that is a, a priority when it comes to who you should choose to represent you politically. Um, appealing to blacks as blacks, women as women, gay people as gay people, not appealing to them as Americans right. with a common interest. That is identity politics, and that is something that uh, President Obama practiced. And it is a very divisive uh, strategy. It helps you get out your base. It may help you scare people to the polls, rile up voters that you need to support you, but at the end of the day, you end up with a very polarized uh, uh, electorate. And that is what um, President Obama practiced for eight years, using his Justice Department to um, uh, uh, investigate uh, uh, police shootings all over the country, um, sending his uh, Attorney General, Eric Holder, out to accuse uh, Republicans of suppressing black okay. voters, trying to disenfranchise them, uh, uh, pushing for uh, uh, affirmative action programs, racial preferences, and so forth. These are very uh, racially divisive uh, things to do when you're president and to use your platform as president to advance these sorts of things. And, and the result, I think, was a very uh, divided, racially divided uh, electorate. Donald Trump, you quote in False Black Power, you quote your friend Shelby Steele, a Hoover fellow here at, the, at Stanford. Shelby Steele writes, and you quote, perhaps the Obama presidency was the culmination of the age of white guilt. Our new conservative president, that is Trump, rolls his eyes when he's called a racist, and we all know that he isn't one. The jig is up, close quote. White guilt, tell us, tell us why you quote that. White guilt means what? Why did it peak under Obama? Why does Shelby Steele argue that maybe it's, it's evaporating, disappearing under Trump? Well, I think a lot of white Americans thought that voting for a black president would get this country over a hump. Um, and uh, they re-elected him because they weren't done congratulating themselves for electing <laughs> the first black president. What? Oh, wait, but you just said something re that's profound. It's witty, but that's well, <laughs> In other words, to, well, to, to, many, record. to many white voters, the election and then the re-election was about white people. It right, was about it, themselves. Right, and what Obama symbolized. Obama was a symbol. Uh, you, you, weren't, you weren't voting for um, the man himself, necessarily. And again, we don't, I hesitate to paint with too broad a brush here, but I think many white Americans right. saw this as, uh, saw him as a symbol of progress and, um, uh, and thought we could, we, could, we could achieve some sort of post-racial America, which is, which is the ideal. What they were missing 
is that, and this gets back to the identity politics that the left practices, liberals have no interest in a post-racial society. They may claim that they long for one, but, but when you uh, want racially gerrymandered voting districts, you don't want a post-racial society. When you want racial preferences in higher education, you don't want a post-racial society. When you name your group Black Lives Matter, you are not practicing post-racialism. <laughs> the, the left has no interest in being post-racial. And, and, and even though they, they regularly claim that they do, and I think that's what uh, a lot of people have missed here. If you're a progressive, if you're a liberal, uh, you want to keep race front and center in our national debates. Oh, whether it's relevant to the discussion or not, you want to keep it front and center because you think it works for you politically. All right. Two fact sets. One from, from False Black Power. I'm quoting you. Obama oversaw by far the slowest recovery since World War II. Six years after the recession officially ended, the jobless rate for blacks was still above 9% and the jobless rate for black teens surpassed 31%. Yet, Obama's share of the black vote was 95% in 2008 and 93% four years later. That's number one. Here's number two. In 2016, Donald Trump received 8% of the African-American vote. The Trump economy is now booming and black unemployment has fallen to the lowest levels ever recorded, mm -hmm. with the result that Donald Trump's support has soared among blacks from the 8% who voted for him to the 9% <laughs> who now give him positive approval ratings. Obama didn't help mm -hmm. and received overwhelming support. Mm -hmm. Trump, I think what, what you would argue is Trump got out of the way mm -hmm. of the economy and look who disproportionately benefited, African-Americans. Right. And the support for him remain, remains nugatory. You know, blacks need economic growth more than they need a black president is the lesson here. Um, though, of course, the left... But is, only 9% is, is of them know it. Well, the, mm. the, there's a lot of, of history here, uh, Peter. Uh, and, and it starts with the history, uh, or the, the modern-day history, of the Republican <coughs> Party and black Americans. Um, uh, blacks typically vote for Democrats in very large majorities, and they've been doing so uh, for decades. Um, I think partly uh, this has to do with the history mm -hmm. of the Republican Party, particularly uh, in the post-Civil Rights era. Um, and I should really to clarify that, the history of conservatives, I should say, in the, where, where conservatives were during the civil rights movement, and, and uh, particularly, and where Southern Democrats were, the ones that became the Dixiecrats. So I think there's a history So you here. mean the Republican Party's base shifting from the Northeast down to the South? Is that the history? What, what, what is the history that... Uh, the, uh, well, the, the, the conservatives that opposed integration. Oh, I see this. But where the conservative movement was during the 1950s and 1960s when it came to the issue of integration and okay. ending Jim Crow and the civil rights movement of the 1950s led by but Dr. Martin Luther King. But wouldn't the, um, the Democratic Southern barons w had far more direct result on keeping, uh, prolonging Jim Crow as far as long as they possibly could. I'm just trying, so f f f Barry Goldwater opposed civil rights acts on constitutional grounds. Nevertheless, oh, uh, yes. is you, that you, what you're you, after? No, 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 you or, do have the history of a higher percentage of Republicans voting, voting for it, for even though Barry the civil right. rights okay. act uh, than Democrats at the time. And that was largely a regional right. vote, depending on what part of the country you represented it, less so than than party, but the, I'm talking about your your sort of uh, John Birch conservative oh, movement, I see. okay, and right. and that that history, and I and I think that there are a lot of Black <clears throat> Americans today of a certain age who remember that history and are probably simply lost to the Republican Party uh, as a result. Um, so I think that's one that's one factor here. So there's something <laughs> historical and simply generational. Generational, yes, yeah, something right. generational. The other issue I think has to do with. Um, the lack of outreach among Republicans to the black community. Republican politicians typically write off this vote. They figure they don't need it to win, and time spent seeking uh, voters, your 
less likely to get means less time seeking voters you're more likely to get. So you don't see a lot of Republicans in black communities visiting barbershops and community centers. You don't see them advertising on black radio stations or during black television shows and so forth. And, and that's reflected in blacks not turning out <laughs> to vote yeah. for Republicans. So, so you have that, that history also right. explains those numbers that, that you see there. I thought Donald Trump had something going for him that a lot of Republicans uh, did not. And that was that he was this public, public figure prior to being a politician who was quite popular within the black community. Uh, particularly his television show, The Apprentice, had a huge black viewership. And I thought that there was an opportunity there for Donald Trump to go into these communities, speak to these folks, and say, you know, I'm a businessman, I'm a developer, I can tell you why these lots are empty. I can tell you where these jobs have gone. I can tell you why those prices are so expensive at that bo bodega down the street instead of a, at the grocery store out in the suburbs. Um, vote for me, and, and, I, and I can begin to fix the these, 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 these situation for you. And he'd have some credibility with these folks. A couple things um, went wrong there. One, I think, was his birtherism that turned right, off right. lots of blacks and who will never right. forgive his efforts to delegitimize the first black president right. on those grounds. <clears throat> um, and secondly, um, once Donald Trump became a politician, um, he did the same math that other Republican politicians did, which is, do I need this vote? Can I win without this vote? And how much time should I spend seeking right. this vote if I don't really need it? So that, that's the, the, there's a paradox that occurred to me as I was reading False Black Power, where you write, understandably so, that African Americans have succeeded politically, President of the United States, an African American, but there's an odd way in which, by granting such overwhelming support to one party, yeah. they've placed themselves outside the usual competition between exactly. the parties for votes. Exactly. So, Democratic politicians have very little incentive mm -hmm. to do anything other than take African Americans for granted. Mm -hmm. They will get that vote. Mm -hmm. There's on the margin, there's a question about whether they can drive up the percentage of people, vo blacks voting, mm -hmm. but they'll have the vote. And Republicans, by contrast, have no incentive to mm -hmm. do anything other than write them off. They're out, yeah. they've, by somehow or other, they've they're not taking. They're the not taking the system. advantage of the two, yeah. of the two party system. The other thing, uh, the other phenomenon you see are more extremist politicians. In other words, the Congressional Black Caucus is among the most liberal, has the most liberal voting uh, uh, record mm -hmm. of, in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, so the blacks that do get elected have no reason to make any appeals to the other side. Right, right. So you're, you're, you're not only um, giving all your votes to, dem to Democrats, you're giving your, all your votes to the most liberal Democrats. And, um, and it's funny because it has come back to haunt um, uh, I think black politicians who want to seek higher office and then need to appeal to, to not just winning a congressional district, but winning the whole state. And, and it makes it more difficult to make that, that transition. And now we're seeing um, a phenomenon where uh, black politicians who had successfully done this, risen as moderates, now find themselves in a much more progressive Democratic Party. Cory Booker, Senator Booker. Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker. The Cory Booker that ran Newark, New Jersey is not the Cory Booker running for president. president. The Kamala Harris who was a prosecutor out in California for many years before she became a senator is not the Kamala Harris running for president. Now they're crowded into this progressive lane of the Democratic Party, uh, trying to be more extremist than their previous uh, political careers would suggest that they really are. Right. Um, what is to be done? The Atlantic's Ta-Nehisi Coates, the United States owes black Americans reparation payments. Quote, American prosperity was ill-gotten and selective in its distribution. What is needed is an airing of family secrets, a settling with old ghosts. What is needed is a healing of the American psyche and the banishment of white guilt Reparations would mean a revolution of the American consciousness. Jason? Um, I think 
the best response to reparations, uh, to the reparations argument that I've ever come across came from Shelby Steele, where he said that uh, slavery can be endured and overcome. It cannot be repaid. And uh, I agree with that. Um, uh, I'd also add that Coates does a brilliant job of explaining why so many previous programs to help blacks have not worked. Uh, in his Atlantic article um, that got a lot of attention, he goes through various great society programs, one after another, that were uh, advanced, expanded, um, resources were poured, bureaucracies were expanded to help blacks and that the result has been negligible and sometimes, in some cases, blacks are worse off. And then at the end of this piece, he calls for yet another wealth redistribution program in the form of reparations. And my question is, why would this one be any more successful than all the ones you've just explained to me haven't worked in the past? I have an I, answer. I don't, <laughs> I have an I don't answer. follow the logic. I have an answer yeah. because the late Charles Krauthammer, mm -hmm. late, the late Charles Krauthammer said yes to reparations if their part, do you remember this? Part of what he called a grand compromise. I'm quoting Charles Krauthammer. This, is, this goes back eight years, I believe. Reparations would be paid. He suggested $50,000 for a family of four. He actually named numbers. We then end mm -hmm. the affirmative action experiment that has been disastrous for African Americans and for America as a whole, and we return to the original vision of Martin Luther King Jr., color blindness. Fine. Reparations, and that's it. After that, color blindness. No more affirmative action. No more special identity programs. Would you buy that? If that no, deal could be I, struck, I, I, would no, you? No, I wouldn't buy it. You and wouldn't. I don't think most Americans would buy it. You, when you talk about reparations in the 21st century, you're talking about people who never owned slaves paying reparations to people who were never slaves. Who is going to be? Who is going to be for that? Okay. <laughs> this, <laughs> So this great act of justice is, is, is unjust. It's, it's crazily un all right. We can't go back and you fix just... this. We have to move forward. I, I think that there's an argument for ending affirmative action on their own on its own merits. I think it's 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 um, uh, uh, it's harming. It's not just ineffective. It's actually uh, doing great harm in the name of helping uh, blacks. So I think there's a there's a case to be made for doing that. But no, I don't think that 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 uh, that reparations are politically feasible. Uh, nor would they, in practice, be any more effective at helping the black poor than all the other previous uh, wealth redistribution schemes that have been put forward over the past half century. Here's Jason Riley's program, False Black Power, I'm quoting. After emancipation, blacks set out, about, set out acquiring the values, habits, and skills necessary to thrive in a capitalist system. The gains were steady and undeniable. If blacks want to begin replenishing that human capital, true power, they shouldn't look to politicians. They should look to their own past. Right. right. Explain yeah. that. Draw well, that the, 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 the problem with looking to politicians is that um, politicians have their own agenda, and it's not always going to be the agenda that uh, the black poor in this case need in particular. And I'll give you an example with, with President Obama. Uh, take education. As you know, school choice is tremendously popular in the black community, particularly among low-income blacks. They're for charters, they're for vouchers at much higher rates than whites. Um, Obama becomes president of the United States and spends eight years trying to shut down a school voucher program in his own backyard in Washington, D.C. that was started by his uh, predecessor, George W. Bush. Why? Why? The first black president in, in uh, could enhance this program that he knows, poll after poll shows, is popular in the black community. The reason is that Barack Obama is no longer simply uh, another black person. He's now a black president. He has uh, special interests that are, are nipping at his heels. He wants to be reelected. He has to indulge these special interests, one of whom are teachers unions who oppose school choice because many of these schools aren't unionized and don't use union labor. Uh, so Obama has a choice. Am I going to side with um, 
my political benefactors or am I going to side with this black constituency that uh, helped put me in office? He made his choice. He sided with the teachers unions. Um, and that's what you're going to see um, because politicians want to get reelected. And, 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 when, and when their interests part ways with those of the people they claim to represent, they're going to they're gonna put their own interests first because that's what, that's what politicians do. And that is the problem for low-income blacks looking to politicians uh, to be their savior. It, it's, it's not going to happen. What, what we want are for blacks to be in a position to thrive no matter who's in office. And, 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 and that's where other groups in America are. And, 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 and they weren't always there, but, but they are today. Uh, one of the, the flip side of this, if you are look you at- Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful? By the way, mm -hmm. one of the statistics that are just so discouraging, when Moynihan, when the Moynihan Report came out in 1965, mm -hmm. he treated as alarming red flags mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. an out-of-wedlock birth rate of 25%. Mm -hmm. That rate is now over 70%. By the way, I should note that among all groups, it's gone up. It's among gone white up. Americans, yeah. it's over 30% now. Yeah. Yeah. But, wow, yeah. um, how, do you, how, how do you put a family, how do you put the family back together? How do you, how do you or is the idea that if you get, if you, how do you do it? Do you have to destroy the, do you have to undo, unravel the great society programs in order to permit ordinary human flourishing to begin taking place again? Those programs that have in place perverse incentives, yes, you do need to get rid of them. Um, you, you, you can't replace a, a, a father in the home with, with a check. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, the government's not very good at raising children <laughs> or being husbands. They're not very good at it. So yes, the right incentives do need to be in place. Uh, I'm not in favor of eliminating uh, the safety net, but it should be temporary. And in many cases, uh, for uh, too many people in this, in, in, in this country, it's become generational, the, the, the safety net. So, um, but, but yes, it, it, as I say with the title, um, Please stop helping us in the previous book. Right. It's not really a matter of what um, we need the government to start doing. It's what we need them to stop doing. I don't think there's a, there's, a, there's a silver bullet government program out there that can fix all this. What we need the government to do is to get out of the way so that this self-development can Natural take place. Natural human aspirations yeah. are as strong in the black community as anywhere else. Oh, and sure. If the government stops sure. thwarting them... Sure. Sure, sure. But when, Improvement when we, will follow. That's when, the argument? Yes. When we talk about the primacy of culture, uh, that's what we mean. But it's also important to add that culture isn't static. Uh, so just because uh, one culture today may be more successful than other cultures doesn't mean that will always be the case. And again, even if you don't like comparisons between blacks and immigrants, and many don't because many blacks uh, have a different a different background. Sure. Uh, coming here as a slave is is different from sure sailing is. over here uh, voluntarily. Right. Um, but look at if if you don't like those comparisons, then let's compare blacks today, the attitudes in black communities today, with the attitudes in black communities of a previous era, and and there you see stark stark differences. There was no uh, uh, acting uh, white. Uh, uh, criticism uh, that, that kids threw at one another uh, generations ago the way they do today. Uh, it wasn't considered shameful to, to be smart, to raise your hand in class, to know the answer, to be bookish. Those weren't smears in the 1920s and 30s and 40s the way they have become today. Those are cultural attitude changes that have happened in this country among blacks over the past 50 years. They've shifted one way now, and there's no reason they, they can't can shift, shift back. back. But what we do need is for uh, our, 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 our leading thinkers today and our politicians and our policymakers to stop making excuses for antisocial behavior that they see today, Jason, uh, which is what too often, too often happens. A few final questions here. So much of what you've been saying just now, and again, so much of false black power <clears throat> is a history book. And you assert again and again and again, there are about eight decades of African-American history. By the way, we're taping this in Black History Month. There are about eight decades from emancipation at the end of the Civil War, during the Civil War, if you want to date it from the Emancipation Proclamation, 
to the passage of the Great Society in the mid-60s. Actually, that's a century. So there's nearly a century of African-American history that has simply been forgotten, or you might even argue suppressed. And I have to say, I'm aware of it only because I read it in three places. Mm -hmm. The works of Thomas Sowell, mm -hmm. Shelby Steele, and Jason Riley. Full stop. Are you, so, so we've got these, these competing narratives. One says African Americans are where they are because of the legacy of slavery. Mm -hmm. And the other says, no, mm -hmm. you're missing a century of progress mm -hmm. that stopped and in some cases was, was reversed. Do you see any signs that among, let's, let's say African-American millennials, the rising generation mm. of greater awareness of the history that you and Tom Sowell and Shelby Steele write about? No, I, don't. I, 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 don't, I don't see it. In fact, I, 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 when I look at um, the success of, of groups like Black Lives Matter and gaining the, 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 the public's imagination, capturing the public's imagination, um, I'm, I'm very uh, pessimistic about this. I, I believe uh, that groups like that or that type of thinking is ascendant in the country right now. Um, uh, this, uh, the whole social justice movement um, makes me very pessimistic that this history um, will start being considered any anytime soon. Um, I, I would argue a few more people are writing about you know, this stuff. You know that, but, of course, you know feel better than what I. You're, right, what, right. You're, what, what, what you're saying, but, but you I also just, have to the understand... The in the academy as well, you'd think... There are wow. doctoral dissertations, this trove of material which has gone unexplored. You're right, and, and, and going back to Moynihan, um, the, the reaction, the, the vitriol that he faced after that report um, scared off a lot of academics and sociologists to studying uh, uh, black culture. So since I, 1965, and, and the subject has been frozen. It, it's, it's, it's been, it's, been it, it's, it, it's taboo to, to go there. That, I think, has changed in some sense. I've, I've, I've read articles by prominent black sociologists like Orlando Patterson and mm -hmm. William Julius Wilson who have said, this is, this is ridiculous. The idea that we can't discuss uh, black cultural pathology when we're talking about racial inequality, the idea that we have to pretend that these two things have nothing to do with one another is ridiculous, and we have to start talking about that. Um, that is not yet the mainstream view, All right. um, but it is. I am. There, there is some sense that that uh, among some black intellectuals, there is a understanding that we can't go on ignoring antisocial behavior and the role it plays in inequality in All this right. country. Jason, uh, you talked about the. Black Lives Matter, the current movements. Let me ask you about a, a, a related movement, renaming Calhoun College at Yale, taking down Confederate monuments, mm -hmm. removing statues of Robert E. Lee. On, on, on the Does list that, of what, things that what, should be concerning uh, uh, the black leadership, uh, th these would be at the, at the bottom, uh, at the very bottom. I, I just, the, 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 that, that is not what, low-income blacks need. Um, right. th they need school choice. And you have the NAACP uh, coming out against charter schools th and, and condemning Calhoun statues. I mean, there's th the disconnect between the priorities of the black leadership and the needs of the black underclass could not be further apart than it is One is today. symbolic political talk, and that's what's happening. And the other is serious and it's, work, and, it's and that's because not what's happening. These, it's, it's because the groups like Black Lives Matter now control the narrative of what drives inequality in this country. And when you control the narrative, it, it's as if the facts don't, don't really matter. Right. And, 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 and so uh, anecdotes uh, replace data, empirical evidence, logic, reasoning. Um, uh, 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 on social media, a, a video goes viral, and so this is representative of what is going on in the country uh, because CNN plays it in loop over and over again, and other networks pick it up. Um, they control the narrative, and, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, that's, that's where we are today. Jason, yeah. last question. You've got one book here, Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed. Now your most recent book, False Black Power. You are a working journalist who has insistently 
almost defiantly identified yourself with what is very much a dissenting or contrarian point of view. And if you spend a few moments looking at comments on these books on Amazon or Googling around <clears throat> whenever Jason Riley write, devotes his column in the Wall Street Journal to matters of race and economic advancement, you get beat up. <laughs> and so this is a pretty simple question. You've just said you're pessimistic. You, you seem to have attached your career to a lost cause. No, what no. What keeps you at it? No, what keeps no, you at it? No, no. I, I, Make me feel I, better about you, Jason, um, about your prospects here. T t Thomas Sowell once wrote that there are uh, some books you write um, for the pure joy of it, and, and there are other books you write because there are things that, that need to be said, and, 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 and other people have better sense than to say them, out loud at least. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that um, uh, these things need to be said. Um, uh, people in the past have said them. Uh, I'm able to say them today. Uh, people like Thomas Sowell and Shelby Steele and Walter Williams have, have paved the way for another generation of people. They've laid the groundwork. They've done the research. Uh, and they're still right. And, um, and they're still right. They're still right. Their arguments are still correct. And, and this needs to, uh, it, it needs to get out there. Um, uh, people need to know that there is an alternative to the narrative pushed by the civil rights old guard, uh, liberals and progressives when it comes to not only um, uh, what blacks are going through today, but how blacks have fared in the past. And because of their own self-interest, whether it's a, an NAACP who wants to stay relevant or, a, or a Barack Obama who wants to, to get elected, they have a very selective view of which histories they're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, but you need honest thinkers out there giving people the full scope of black history, which is more than a history of what whites have, have, have done to blacks. That, that's not the, 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 the sum of black history in this country, but you might think it is listening uh, to some on the left discuss, discuss our past. So no, I, I, I think that um, uh, I'm providing something of a public service in continuing to write about um, these things from a different, a different perspective, because there's, there's more than one way to, uh, to tell this story. Jason Riley, author of Please Stop Helping Us and False Black Power, thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.